Journalists use sources to get facts and to get quotes. And for the most part, we determine how we're going to use those quotes, how many of them we're going to use, where we're going to put them in our story. As long as we do that fairly and accurately, that's okay. But in the election of 2012, um, a practice came to light that became pretty controversial called quote approval. And it uh, proved uh, actually to be pretty prevalent across journalism. And we're going to take a look at that here. The first article that really brought this practice to life came from the New York Times. I'm going to show it to you here. Um, it was a story by Jeremy Peters, and it talked about uh, the latest word on the trail was, I take it back, and that quotes uh, that were being um, offered by campaign officials such as uh, David Plouffe, uh, the senior White House advisor, um, Eric uh, Fernstrom was a Romney advisor, that they were actually stipulating that those articles, um, the quotes had to be uh, approved by them and that they had every right to make changes to them and to uh, make sure that they sounded the way they wanted before they sent them back. So here so here's the article and I provided a link to you uh, both on the iTunes U page and also on Facebook. So what is quote approval? Fundamentally, it means that quotes that are provided to a journalist are then returned to the source so that the accuracy can be confirmed um, is, is always the, the primary purpose, but also so they can be changed. And, and basically um, what this is uh, allowing sources to do is to kind of carefully construct, uh, in the words of David Carr from the New York Times, a performance that's meant to showcase the participants in the best light. So it's kind of taking the spontaneity out of uh, reporting, it's out of answers, um, you know, a reporter's ability to kind of uh, get really authentic and pure quotes is being lost in this practice. It began with Ari Fleischer, uh, although, you know, it's happened in the past. I mean, there's always going to be sources that ask you for uh, stories to so get them returned uh, so that they can take a look at them before they're published. Most publications, almost all publications I've ever worked for, have said that that is not an acceptable practice. But um, Ari Fleischer, uh, who was the press secretary for George W. Bush, basically said, uh, we're not giving you any information unless you give us the approval to uh, to, to look at these quotes and, and make sure that they're, they are what we want them to be. Um, and that's when we really started getting restrictions on public officials based on this policy. So in 2012, both Obama and Romney campaigns insisted that they could get veto power over any of the quotes that they had that they didn't like. And most importantly, reporters agreed to that because without it, they weren't going to get access to the Romney or the Obama campaigns. So, you know, the quotes were coming back redacted, um, a lot of colorful metaphors were being taken out, the more colloquial language was being uh, homogenized, um, and really anything that was mildly kind of provocative or, or colorful was being taken away. So this New York Times story uh, that Jeremy Peters ran, um, you know, cited specifically two cases with the Obama and Romney uh, campaigns. Jim Messina, the Obama campaign manager, had a uh, pretty... Um, foul mouth and and those quotes were taken back because uh, he deleted all the curse words before we'd approve the quotes and then Stuart Stevens who's a Romney strategist would often uh, say pretty snide things about other political opponents and he wouldn't let them be in print either. Now the challenges, of course, with the immediacy of, of Twitter and the news cycle, um, you know, and, and, and the speed with which uh, media reports things. Also, you know, media doesn't have the same relationship with politicians that they used to. There's not really a level of protection that used to, to exist between the media and the politicians that they covered. So, um, you know, gaffes are getting out in, in record numbers. Uh, they, they hit uh, the social media mainstream and, and off they go to be... Uh, circulated around the world of uh, someone doing something that they later wish they hadn't. Um, so, you know, this kind of unforgiving, obsessed media culture is, is what's driving public officials to try to get this level of protection. Um, the other thing is that uh, reporters don't necessarily get information correctly. That's sources say a lot, that they're, they're misquoted. Um, and, you know, it's really hard to type or write as quickly as someone speaks. Um, if something's in quotations, it should be verbatim what someone says, uh, with the exception that, like, verbal lubricants are taken out, like, like and you know. But other than that, the information should be exactly as it was out of someone's mouth. And um, because the media has not always adhered to that ethical practice, um, sources want to protect themselves really from distortion. Now, it's it, it's a challenge because it certainly takes away the spontaneity and authenticity of interviews. I mean, these are on-the-record quotes that are kind of being taken off the record, manipulated, and then put back on the record. Um, and 
we're we're not really serving the public as well as we could be when people have a chance to think over what they say and make sure that it's exactly the right message. We're missing getting to know political figures in their purest form and in, in the form that we should know them before we elect them. And, you know, as David Carr put it, the quotation is the last refuge of spontaneity in an age of endlessly managed messages. So taking away this spontaneity is really uh, putting kind of a whitewash on everything that we cover. It used to be that um, reporters were either told to go away or told what they know. Um, now, you know, we're looking at a lot of interviews coming with preconditions, um, you know, different uh, requirements regarding approval of quotes. Um, and what we're seeing is this is rising in direct proportion to the number of PR people who are involved in uh, in, in the quote making process. And so, it's uh, it's part of a, a PR uh, agent's job to control the message. And and they have found that if the media is willing to be controlled in this way, then why not take advantage of it. So reporters also cut corners uh, by sending messages by email. Uh, we uh, don't allow email interviews uh, for the most part um, because of this very purpose. If you send someone a question and then you let them write out their answer and then you copy and paste it, you've basically given them a quote approval. They've had a chance to craft that message, to massage it, to edit it, to re-edit it. Um, and it's you're losing that, that spontaneity, that kind of back and forth that you can get with sources, the possibility that something that's unrehearsed and that comes out of a, a top-of-the-head approach or something in the spur of the moment is going to be completely lost. And, you know, it's usually public officials get in trouble for saying something, not that they misspoke about, but because that's really what they were thinking or feeling. And by uh, kind of taking the lazy track of letting people submit their quotes by email or this idea of quote approval, you're taking out any potential that we're really going to see people in their purest light. So, as we mentioned, it's it's rising in direct proportion to the involvement of PR people, um, and it's going to continue to, to increase the more that we allow PR people to control messaging and we go through PR people to get our quotes and sources. So, you know, the most recent example that we've had here is uh, in July 2011, there was a Bloomberg Business Week profile on uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, and um, they acknowledged that the press office was jittery about allowing reporters to talk to staff on the record, and she agreed to two interviews on the basis that Bloomberg Business Week allow her to approve the quotes before publication. So I'm wondering what you think about that, because we, we've certainly um, been evolving uh, in a great deal since this came to light, but, you know, when you have a candidate like Elizabeth Warren, who's running in Massachusetts, very, uh, very heated race um, in, a, in a pretty uh, significant market. She's certainly been a rising star in the Democratic Party. How do you feel about the fact that uh, her quotes may have been manipulated by, uh, you, you know, the PR machine and, and may have masked her true uh, feelings um, so that she could get out a message that would be more popular with voters? Well, I can tell you that the Washington Post and Vanity Fair were letting sources approve quotes prior to publication. Huffington Post evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the AP absolutely does not permit quote approval, and they said that they've declined interviews that way. Um, they think most of our reporters know that uh, pushback in a situation like that. Now, the Harvard Crimson was allowing it. They said they would no longer allow it, and, and I've given you an article that talks about their decision-making process. Um, and I've also uh, given you some examples who have rejected it, most notably the New York Times. So although they were allowing it during the 2012 campaign uh, a great deal and until the story that came out, um, on September 20th of 2012, Jill Abramson, who was then the managing editor, said that starting now uh, she wants to draw a clear line and said that uh, sources would not be allowed to um, uh, ask for quote approval as a condition of their interview. And we know that that was going to be a problem, she said, but that in order for the Times to maintain its integrity, that that practice would no longer be allowed. So we're going to talk about this in class as an ethical issue, what you think about quote approval, what effect you think it's going to have or could have, uh, where you think it's going to go in the future, whether this is something that we can successfully push back on or whether it's here to stay.